Stay informed on all the news that matters most to the military community with a subscription to Stars and Stripes Digital Access. As a subscriber, you'll enjoy unlimited access to the Stripes.com website and our Stars and Stripes mobile apps, updated 24-7 by reporters stationed at military bases around the globe. Subscribe today and enter the promo code PODCAST when signing up for a yearly subscription and receive 50% off your first year. Get exclusive access to special features, interactive articles, award-winning photography, and more. Visit stripes.com slash digital and enter the promo code PODCAST to subscribe today. This is Force for Hire. A deep dive into private military contracting and how it's transforming the battlefield. I'm Michelle Harvin. And I'm Desmond Ferris. Today, we'll be hearing from a really badass woman. Her name is Cindy Waldron, and she wrote a book called Cindy in Iraq, A Civilian's Year in the War Zone. Cindy was a truck driver for 12 years before she went off to Iraq with KBR in 2003. And like most of the overseas contractors we've spoken with, she came from a military family. I've got two great uncles that are triple veterans, Korean War, World War II, and Vietnam. My grandmother, she was in the Army during World War II. Brothers, a Desert Storm veteran, and son, an Iraq veteran. That's just on my mom's side. That doesn't even get over to my dad's side. So it's a long, long family history of military service. What brought Cindy to the world of contracting is a story of self-discovery. Before she went overseas, Cindy and her husband were both driving trucks across the U.S., so our time at home was not really spent together very much. And I did not realize how bad his drug and alcohol addiction was and to, to, for several years. And like anybody else who grows up with self-image problems and, and, and things and stuff, you know, I, could, I, I thought I could help him, thought I could help pull him out of it. You know, I'm, I've got a very sympathetic soul. And uh, it just didn't work. And his mental and emotional abuse got worse until it got to the point that he got drunk. We were on a run and got laid over in Ogden, Utah. He got drunk and stupid in the bar. I managed to get him out of the bar without getting his tail kicked. And uh, it just it escalated from there. Um, his hands around my throat, uh, me blacking out calling the cops, having him arrested, loading the trailer seven hours later and leaving him sitting up there. One of the one of the people that was a mechanic at the trucking company that I worked for at the time was uh, in the National Guard. Through the grapevine, he found out what had happened. And he says, look, Halliburton is hiring drivers. You keep running into your ex on the road. You need to get away or you're going to get sucked back in and I'm going to end up having to come home for a funeral. So why don't you just put an application in and see if you can come over here? And I did. Two weeks later, I was in Houston going through orientation and stuff. I went to Houston in, at the end of August 2003 and shipped, hopped the plane and went over the big pond. And I think it was September 22nd or September 23rd of 2003 when I hit the ground in Kuwait. Coming from the military family and having tried to join the military several times, when I come out of high school, my dad wanted me to, to go to college and I wanted to join the Navy. And so he talked me into going to college. And then, of course, you know, pregnant, married, kids, that got derailed. Tried again later on and ended up drinking and roller skating don't mix and broke broken arm and that took me out and uh so this was my way of serving going over it was also the sense of adventure and getting to go to a part of the world that many 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 people are not going to get to see because it's so volatile over there and also part of it was just coming out of that abusive marriage and being so down on myself you know, it's it, it's a common thing with abuse, or I say it's a common thing with abused people. How can you love this person and them do that to you? And and how could somebody who said they wanted to spend the rest of their life with me try to kill me? So you go, you go through a big mental complex and stuff. And, and I had all these ideas. It's like, my life is miserable. I've got to do something drastic. You know, 
and part of me is just wanting to die and part of me is like i know there's too much of life to live it's 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 a massive conflict so it was like i'm going to go over there and hopefully have a great adventure and i know it's going to be scary and one way or another i'm either going to get my head and my heart straightened out and pull myself up by my bootstraps or i'm going to come home in a pine box either way my suffering will quit i don't know it's kind of cool because like the plane comes in to land to land at the airport in Kuwait and you can see all these pretty lights and stuff and you can see the way way the Kuwait city and everything is laid out and it's it's rings and circles and stuff and how it fans out and all and it was it was it was pretty and it was scary and it was exciting and sometimes I was sitting there thinking what the heck are you doing girlfriend and then other times it's like we're gonna make the most out of this i'm gonna come out of here a different person and that's besides the the family history of military service and stuff here i am i'm gonna get a chance to support the military i'm gonna make some money and hopefully get my head straightened out and go back home a better person over there i was transporting food water anything that went in a reefer unit a reefer is short for a refrigerated trailer and I know most people think reefer and they, they go to that little green substance, but no, it's it's a it's a refrigerated trailer that keeps stuff. You can take it all the way down and freeze stuff on it. It's just meant to keep perishable items cool. I uh, was with the flatbeds for about a week. And with that, I hauled everything from Humvees to M80 tanks. Being a truck driver in Iraq was one of the most dangerous contracting jobs you could have other than probably security. We were out running the roads where, and, and, and my son gets on to me for comparing contracting work to military, to the soldiers out there. But sometimes that's the only way you can make people understand, especially other military people. Um, no, we didn't carry guns. No, we didn't purposely put ourselves in harm's way like the military did. And I'll do respect to that. Um, but we were, we ate we slept, we run the roads with the military. We were on the same roads that they were getting shot at. We were getting shot at. We were getting shot at. We were getting wounded and we were dying out there on the same roads that military personnel were doing it as well. I was about there about nine, nine and a half months when I went through my first ambush. And I went through six ambushes in two and a half months time. And they progressively got worse until the last one that happened in Baghdad, yeah, in Baghdad, basically. And I had uh, the guy that was supposed to be my driver was sitting in the passenger seat. And he got shot in the leg, and one of the TCNs got shot in the leg, and one of the soldiers in one of the military transport. We were running. There was military transport people on that convoy. And uh, he got some glass in his eyes and stuff. It was it was it was pretty scary. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. It was really scary and stuff. There was not as many women as there was men driving trucks over there. And just my suspicion, I don't have any proof to it, but I think they would hire anybody with a CDL to go over there and drive a truck. But it seemed like a lot of the women, not within the first three months of them getting over there would take a promotion or this, that, and the other, and they would end up in an office. It's like they got them out of the truck. It's like they didn't, they'd hire you to drive, hire women to drive trucks, but they try to get you out of it. So yeah, you'd get, there were women driving trucks. There was women in the reefer section. There was women in the tanker section and all the other sections and stuff too, but a lot of them rotated out. I mean, they even tried that with me at one time, tried to promote me. Oh, this is going to be a promotion. And, you can sit in an office and you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. You don't have to be out on the roads risking your life kind of thing. But I don't know, maybe it's coming from the family I come from that uh, I went there to drive a truck and haul supplies to the troops. That's what I was going to do. I didn't go there to, to, you know, use my CDL so that I can get over there and get a cushy job and sit safely inside the, not to diminish that because I don't want to get, get called out oh the camps got bombed and there was there's crap there too but it was a lot safer inside the wire than it was running the roads what they called the what was that the easter massacre april 9th of 2004 
and that's they we lost uh, several military personnel, several contractors. I think one of them they never found his body. Um, and Tommy Hamill was kidnapped, and he was in captivity for I believe it was 23 days when he escaped. A week before that, maybe not even a week. Week before that, we I had a convoy. We were headed south, coming through Baghdad, and those that have been there, they know out there on Sword where the big pretty mosque is and all and we're stopped in traffic right there um there'd been some stuff going on didn't know what was going on our escorts stop us there and tell me there's some stuff going on they're gonna check it out they're pulling a perimeter clear all the the traffic out from around us all the civilian traffic other than the trucks i next thing i know they're pulling these two dump trucks and i've got one on my right side and one on my left side and they're blocking my view from my side windows because in that area, especially if you're familiar with it, there's all those rooftops and you're wanting to watch the rooftops. Your, your, eye, your head's on a swivel. You're watching all the rooftops. You don't want to get shot at. You don't want your people to get shot at. You're looking at everything. And they pull these trucks up there and block my view. I was pissed. So I got a hold of the sergeant that uh, was running the escort crew that I had for that trip. And I was like, why did you put them there? They're in my way. I can't see. He says, well, they're there to protect you. And I said, well, I'd rather you put them with my people behind me because I'm sitting right behind your Humvee. I'm protected. Put them back there on my guys where they can't shoot them. And he basically told me, no, ma'am, because people in the United States can handle those guys getting shot easier than what they can handle a woman getting shot. So we have to protect you, which I thought was crap. I signed mm -hmm. up for that. I stayed in that. And, and I imagine a lot of because women are breaking ground in military MOSs now and getting into some of these that, that before they wouldn't be able to be in because they're a woman. They've got boobs and, and stuff, and, and I'm sure they feel the same way I do. I, I signed up to be here. I don't need special treatment. I don't need special protection. I am equal with those guys back there when it comes to that. So that's kind of how that is. Nothing they told us in Houston really prepared you for what you experience over there at all. You you kind of get over there and, and you, you take what works and you throw away what doesn't. It doesn't matter how much training you get here in the States and how well you think you'll handle getting shot at. You don't know what you're going to do until you get shot at. And just because you've been shot at one time doesn't mean you're going to react the same time than you get shot at a second, third, or fourth time. You, every situation is different. I, I, I don't really know how to how to put it. You know, some people have some people have the wherewithal to 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 get past it, and some don't. Um, when after the Tommy Hamill thing, they had 800 drivers quit and come home and my family's I'm getting emails and this that, and the other and I'm gonna let, I'm not gonna let them bastards scare me off it ain't happening and you've got that and then you know I knew guys that were prior military that were on the first thing smoking after Tommy Hamill got kidnapped but I know other former military guys that were right there with me to heck with them they ain't scaring us off so it's it's an individual thing my son, um, from the time he was old enough to walk and talk, wanted to join the military. And coming from this family, I encouraged it. You know, if that's what you want to do, that what makes you happy, you have my full support. When he finally did join the military and sign up and all, I sat down with him and said, all right, with the way things are in this world, before you sign your name on that line, you understand that this is not a way out of Helena, Arkansas. This is not a way to get a college education. Yes, those things can happen, but understand this is what military does. Military is there to protect our freedoms in this country. And sadly, we end up playing police to the world, but it's very possible you could end up in a war zone as long as you understand that you could end up in a war zone and you could come home wounded, messed up, or in a pine box. I support you 100%. And he understood that. His dad and I made sure he understood that growing up. And we had a little discussion about how he didn't, he didn't want me to be there at the same time he was. His fear was, as he put it, he didn't want to roll up on a ambushed convoy and find my dead or mangled body laying on the road. And it's, you know, he's the one putting himself in harm's way, toting the gun. You know, how can I 
tell him, oh, I, I, you know, I want to go, so I'm going to go. I can't be selfish like that. I'm his mom. So I, I agreed to stay home. Uh, I think it was a couple of months later after he shipped over, a um, couple of months later, his unit rotated home. And he called me and he says, I hope you're not pissed, mom. And I said, why? He says, well, you might not be happy with the decision I made. And I said, what, you're going to stay? You volunteered to stay? And he goes, how did you know? I said, well, you're a chip off the old block. I've been home, you know, six months. I'm chomping at the bit. I want to go back. I guess about a month after that happened, he told me, if if you want to come back, you can. And that's when I found IAP. And I was I was back in Iraq a month later and all. And I actually got to see him a couple of times. Um we uh had to, he was stationed in uh Liberty up there and of course civilian convoys are in and out of Biop all the time and uh through Yahoo Messenger let him know that I'm gonna be in somewhere around you know, you try to do this as vague as you can so that you're not if anybody's tapping in, they don't get exacts, but you know, hey, I'm gonna be in somewhere around these dates, whatever, you know. And uh <clears throat> So I got to see him a couple of times, which was really cool. He went to introduce me to a sergeant and, you know, the, the, uh, hooches have big concrete walls around them to protect them from any incoming blasts and stuff. So we walk in between and up the steps and, and Kenny's like, Hey, Serge, I want to introduce you to my mom. And the sergeant looks at me. And I think his jaw dropped halfway to the ground and he looks at Kenny and he looks at this other dude standing there and he looks back at me, looks back at the dude and he goes, we're in Iraq, right? And I just busted out laughing because it was so funny. You know, it's like Kenny says, I told you my mom was here. He says, yeah, but we thought you were full of it. (laughs) Being in, in a place like that with with family, especially your child. I mean, there's a certain dynamic, you know, parents and kids have. When I came home, I was home for Christmas and, you know, they've got the news on because, you know, my son's there and they, they're thinking I'm wanting to watch the news, which is the last thing I want to watch. And talking about ambushes here and ambushes there and stuff. And um, they're they're asking me, you know, it's like, oh, my God, aren't you worried about Kenny? And I'm just like, well, where is this happening? And it's like, oh, well, no, he's fine. And they just look at me funny. And it's like. Because I, you know, I just came from over there. I know where his patrol is. So I can listen to the news and know whether my son's okay or not. It's an advantage that other parents here in the States don't have. But also in the same aspect, I don't have, I don't have to use my imagination while my kid's over there. I was there. I know what happens. I have a very realistic idea of where my where my child is, what kind of terrain he's going to, how dangerous that area is, and what can happen him to him during that. And sometimes that's a blessing, and sometimes it's your worst nightmare. I worked for KBR and was there from September 03 to the end of August 04, while I was working for KBR, I was sexually assaulted. The reporting of the sexual assault was a mixed bag. Um, I didn't report it when it initially happened. Um, and I probably don't have to explain that. Everybody knows the stigma with that kind of stuff. And they damn sure know the stigma of that kind of stuff happening in that kind of situation, you know, overseas contract, military contract, military. I mean, it, it, it happens, you know, we like to believe the best of our people doing this kind of work, but you know, there's always bad apples. Doesn't mean they're all that way, but, um, it took me a month to report it. Um, it took a really good friend of mine, Matt, to convince me to report it. I was a bit of a basket case. It had happened in, they had, the villa they had us housed in, um, was sitting right on the beach and stuff. It happened in the room that I was in. And so it was really hard to go back to that room for me. 
um, my friend would let me come stay over in his villa um, because I couldn't sleep in my bed. Um, or, or I would, you know, grab a cot and go sleep somewhere else. Or I just did my best to stay out on convoys, you know, because I could lock the door on my truck. And they didn't, they didn't, we didn't have a key to the front door of the villa. We didn't have a key to our room. So I couldn't lock myself into a room. The only room that you could lock yourself into was probably the bathroom. You just, you just couldn't do it. And especially when you shared a room with somebody else, you know, even if you could have locked the door when you went in, you know, that uh, your roommates got to be able to get in and they don't have a key to the door. So you're, you're pretty much left open. Um, but Matt, Matt would, would, would call and talk to me and talk me till I fell asleep or let me stay over in his villa so that I could, I could sleep. And finally he, it, it took him a month to convince me you know, to report it and more because of, I guess the same old adage, you know, if you don't report it, he's going to do this to somebody else. And he kept pounding that into my head until it, it sunk in and I reported it. And when I first reported it, I didn't actually report it as a sexual assault. Um, I reported it as somebody breaking into my room because uh, I didn't want to report the sexual assault. And the guy that was trying to take my statement for the break-in and all, uh, I guess, I fell apart and started crying because they were wanting me to write out a statement. And here I am trying to figure out how to write out this statement without telling them all of what happened. And it just didn't work. And I broke down crying. And that's when they finally got it out of me of what fully happened. Um, it was... It was crazy um, because of being a civilian contractor. It's a different dynamic. If I had been military, I probably could have just met and dealt with military police and, and, and that kind of stuff. But because I was a civilian contractor and it happened out off base in a, you know, residence in the Kuwait public, you know, kind of stuff. The Kuwaiti police also had to get involved. And it's, you're dealing with a, a Muslim country and the dynamics sometimes of some of those areas and how women are treated and, and stuff. So I'm having to deal with, with the military and their police and the Kuwaiti police and my feelings. And it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. You know, luckily I had Matt went to a lot of, a lot of those stuff. Um, a lot of those meetings and stuff. This is months after it happened because I reported it to, I reported it. It got to KBR security. KBR reports it to the military, military contacts, Kuwait police and back and forth. And they're wanting me to make a statement here. Want me to make a statement there. Want me to make it. And, and I just, I didn't want to. And then I got moved from Kuwait up to Camp Anaconda. And that was like the perfect uh, opportunity to avoid having to go talk to the Kuwaiti police. I've told this story to the KBR, KBR security. I've told this to the military people and stuff. I don't want to have to tell this to more strangers and all. It just, I didn't want to do it. So my getting moved to Anaconda was a per perfect opportunity to avoid having to do this. And I guess it showed my mental state because when we were, we had a convoy get ambushed and I had one of, one of the drivers in my convoy, real, real cool guy got shot in the leg and uh, his name was Roy Hawkins. Really, he's prior army, really, really cool guy. Um, and, and I have to give him kudos because even after he got shot in the leg, he, he, he drove that truck into a checkpoint himself and, and the rest of the guys and the crew slowed down and let him pass, let him pass them till he was up. He moved from like 13th truck to eighth truck from the time he got shot to up there and, and he got it inside the checkpoint. So I give him kudos. Some of those guys, it was the first time they'd gotten ambushed and I'm all up in arms, you know, and we could finally make it to Kuwait and they start telling me that they're going to take, this part of my crew and send them off with this convoy and this part of my crew and send them off with another convoy. And 
these other guys, basically they're going to split us up to the four winds when we were supposed to stay all together. And after Roy got shot, we were all like, and Camp Anaconda's home. We came down together. We're going home together. We're not leaving anybody behind. And then they split us up and we don't have a choice about it. So I went off and my supervisor pulled me aside and, and told me that somebody else was taking over my convoy and taking it back to Anaconda that it was time I reported that I had my talk with the Quady police and I told them I didn't want to. And they offered counseling and stuff. And this guy named Dave was the counselor. And I spent five weeks talking to him before we went and talked to the Kuwaiti police and, uh, I kudos to him. He had no clue what to, what to do. He had never dealt with anybody who had been sexually assaulted. And he told me so he, he was, calling back to the states and asking people here in the states how to deal with me because he didn't have a clue and that's fine I think actually that probably worked better because it, in some ways it helped me open up a little bit more because I didn't have didn't have his preconceived ideas of of the course of treatment as you want to call it to deal with it and whatever we kind of learned together as we go and all and he went he he made sure he went to meet with me to talk to the Quady police. And when it got, oh, he, because of five weeks of sitting and talking to me, he knew where my limit was. So when it got to the point that he knew I was going to break, um, he stopped them. He didn't let them, let them push me too hard. And I'm, I'll forever be grateful to him for that. But it was, it was crazy. And then I stayed a couple of more weeks down in Kuwait doing a little more counseling. And then, finally convinced them that I was not going to kill myself or somebody else or whatever and got to get on the convoy and go back, go back home, go back to Anaconda. KBR did try to get me to come home after the sexual assault. They really wanted me to come home. Um, I didn't want to come home, but I did want to come home. Um, Matt made the comment to me that it would be a shame for me to come home because out of all the people he's met over there, I was one of the few people that believed in why I was there. And that was because I was there to support the troops. Yeah, the money was great, but that's not why I went. Um, I went there to support the troops. I went there because I knew my son was going to end up there one of these days and somebody was going to be doing the same thing for him. And I would hope that that would be a person that gave a crap about, his well-being and whether he was comfortable and not just because they were making a dollar off of it. Um, and so that kind of convinced me to stay, not to mention the fact that my history and life of, you know, I've, I've had two abused, abusive husbands and, you know, his, his comment was, you're going to let another man dictate to you what you're going to do with your life. You wanted to do this. So stay here and do it. Don't let this sexual assault and what some man did to you stop you from doing what you believe in and where your heart is. And so I stayed. KBR didn't like it, but I believe that in some ways I was made an example of. Um, my sister had had a web page on the internet to post to just to keep my, cause I got such a large family. Like I got 30 first cousins, if not more you know, big family and everybody's, they're tight. They're, you know, my dad, especially my dad's side of family, they're a Christian family, several Baptist preachers in the family, very tight knit family. And everybody, you know, Albert's daughter's over there driving a truck as a civilian contractor. Oh, we got to keep up with her. So my sister set up a website here in the States just to keep people updated. I got in trouble over it. Then later on, we had the Yahoo groups and, and, People want my stories and, you know, I'm telling them what I can, you know, there's certain stories you can tell without breaking OPSEC. And, uh, so I was telling a few stories and talking about what I was seeing and this, that, and the other, and you know, how messed up mainstream media was and what they were reporting. It was all doom and gloom about them, about what was happening over there. And I wanted them to see some of the, the brighter spots, uh, you know, the, the good people I met and the fun times we had and, you know, just, just the truth of everything. And two weeks later, I was on a convoy from Anaconda down to Kuwait and had made it to Cedar 2. And 
Uh, next thing I know, they're pulling me out of my truck and I was terminated. They said I violated operational security and uh, was going to send me home. I think I was made an example of between the sexual assault and the fact that I didn't keep quiet. I complained about, you know, they got us running around with little Motorola radios that have no security to them. And we're having to radio every time we come in and out of a gate in, in Iraq. Tell me how stupid that is. It's like, come shoot me. Here I am. You know, um, so, I, you know, there was things I, I was, I was a pain. <laughs> I, was, I was a big pain and it was their way of trying to get rid of me. When I came back from, now, now here's the thing, and, and I know your listeners are going to understand this. You do things here in the States and you go to a combat zone and you have to do what worked here or some of the things you do here, especially like driving, you can't do over there. You know, over there, you know, we didn't stop for stoplights. We didn't stop for stop signs. You didn't stop, period. You kept rolling. You didn't run over. We had an old saying, if it don't blow, it's a no-go because it could be an IED. It didn't matter if it was a paper chip bag, a soda can, or what. If the wind didn't blow it, you stayed the hell away from it dog carcasses in the road they could be packed with ieds anything laying in the road i think at one time i think i heard something about them pulling asphalt off of the road putting ieds in it and putting the asphalt back on top of it you know so potholes are a danger but you get into this mode you try it's easier to train yourself to do stuff that keeps you alive it's easier to train to go over there and keep yourself alive than it is to untrain yourself from doing those things when you come back home. I came back home and went back to the trucking company that I'd been driving for before I went. And within the first week, I was ready to quit and never drive a truck again. I, uh, I, don't, get, I don't think I realized I had the problem until I had the problem. I was coming through uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area and I'm about a tractor trailer length off this pickup in front of me in the far left lane. All of a sudden, this dark dog carcass comes out from underneath that pickup in front of me. And all I see is the bright red. And I set my truck in the, the next lane to my right and don't remember moving lanes. Don't remember thinking about moving lanes. I remember seeing the dog carcass and I remember I'm in this other lane. And it scared the crap out of me. I, I, I got up, pulled off the shoulder road, and almost couldn't stand up because I was sitting there thinking, oh, my God, I could have killed somebody. You know, doing what I did was part of what helped keep me alive over there so that I didn't get blown up. But doing it here was going to get somebody killed. And it's like, I've got to find some way to get over this, or I've got to quit driving a truck. Luckily, I had a former military friend of mine drove for the same company he understood and he says come run team with me so i went and ran team it took six months it took six months to try to untrain me or to get where i could get enough of a grip that i didn't do things like that that going out west where they've got the red lights flashing on top of the windmills out there and you're tired and you don't see those as tracer rounds or driving at night and not being lit up. The first first night I tried to drive with, you know, Earl and I are running a team to, so that I can get out of this, and he's gone to bed, and I'm driving, and it starts to get dark, and the darker it gets, the more I start turning lights off on the truck to the point that I turned the CB off, and I've got a rag hanging over the stereo, and the only lights I have on on the outside of the truck are what I legally have to have, and those are bothering me because I'm lit up. The dash lights are off. You know, I was freaking out. He wakes up. I hear the Velcro on the, the bunk curtain, and it's like, oh, thank God you're up, and I immediately hit the shoulder. I can't do this. It took me six months to get to where I could drive at night. Now it's, what, 2019, so it's been quite a few years, 13 years since then. And I do all right, but it's, it's, not, it's not to say that I don't have those moments where I get uncomfortable. Um, in my own home, 
90% of the time at night, the only light that's on in my house is the TV. And if I could watch TV without there being light, I'd be doing it. <laughs> it's kind of hard to do. So, so it, it, some of it stays with you, but also in the aspect of what I do now, um, I came home in May of 2006 in November, November 19th of 2008. I remember it very well. Um, I was on top of a loaded flatbed and it, and it shifted and I went off head first from 10 feet in the air, shattered both my wrists and the bridge of my nose. Very lucky to be alive. Today I'm a pilot car. I escort oversized loads for probably about seven years now. I've been escorting SpaceX rocket sections. Um, the first commercial rocket that went to supply the International Space Station, I escorted the second stage, the capsule, and I think the trunk of that rocket. Um, I've, I'm, I, you, you know how you see all those little shows on the History Channel and this, that, and the other, and it's all this, you know, the janitor had this story and stuff, or this person had this story, and you get a behind-the-scenes story of all these historic events that happen in the world. That's how I feel. I'm that little nobody in there that without people and people like me, they couldn't do that historic event. And so nobody will never know my name, you know, in history or anything like that. But I've got my pictures and I've got the patches from the missions of the ones I've escorted. And I've got my photos from, I can't post none of that online, you know, operational security and industrial espionage and all that kind of stuff. But I can take my own stuff and put it on my own walls. And stuff. So I've been compiling a thing like that. And who knows, you know, 100 years from now when we're, we're, you know, got colonies on Mars or God knows where, you know, my, my grandkids, great, great, great grandkids or somebody will find that and go, oh, my great, great grandma. And, I, and it'd be cool. It'd be something that they could talk about. Just that little, little sliver of history that I had a part of. People ask me to define my time over there, and I jokingly say I had a blast and I got blasted, but that's the truth. There were some really good times. I met some really great people all from all over the world and in our armed forces and stuff, just really awesome people. I met some, excuse my term, dumbasses, and some people that I just really didn't want to be around t uh, anymore either, but... In general, it was really great people, um, great experience, made some great friendships, have memories that I will you know, never forget. And you, you not only find out about yourself when you're in a place like that, but you find out kind of the characteristics of human nature. And, and you learn you can't, you can't put all people in one, one block. There's good and bad in everything. And I choose to define my time in Iraq as a positive thing because, first off, I came back home a better person. Yes, I achieved one of my goals, but I also got to see, you know, the part of the world that nobody, that a lot of people aren't going to get to see and experience things that a lot of people are not going to get to experience unless they're in the military. And I got to experience that as a civilian. I have chosen that my experience over there and what I choose to remember and focus on for my time over there is the fun times, the standing on top of the loaded fuel tank or howling at the moon at mid to midnight, half drunk and with buddies and, you know, different, different fun things, walking into the MWR and seeing, you know, these kids that are my son's age got a DJ up there and they're dancing. And for a few moments, they're having a good time and not thinking about the fact that tomorrow they could get shot at. Those are the, those are the memories I choose to put in the forefront of my mind. And therefore it was a great experience. There's women that's had worse lives than me. I know that God knows. I know that. Um, but two abusive marriages, um, and one of those tried to kill me, um, a sexual assault in, in a far off land. And this is anybody that, that, probably have a good excuse to be screwed up in the head I, I probably do and some of my friends might say I am but <laughs> that's another story <laughs> but um, you you can do what you want to do don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't 
unless you try. And even though you have been, if you've been through stuff like I have or worse, it is your choice to be a victim or be a survivor of it. And it's not easy to go from being the victim to being a survivor. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of introspective and looking inside yourself and consciously making the decision, I am not a victim. We are all the sum of our experiences, but that does not make us, does not mean that we have to be a victim. We are survivor of that, and hopefully we learn from those experiences. We become better people from those experiences, and we share, even though they're painful, share those experiences with other people so that they know they're not alone. Wow, Michelle. You were right. Cindy is one badass woman. I know. I love her. It was so much fun talking with her. She's uh, very open about what she experienced, which I think will be helpful for a lot of people to hear. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy. I was like, wow, this woman did this work. And yeah, it was just awesome. She's awesome. Super and strong. Super strong and should motivate a lot of young women out there. I think so. Thanks to Cindy for taking the time to share her experience with us. If you want to hear more, you can check out her book, Cindy in Iraq. Next episode, we're going beyond our Western world. We'll be kicking off an international view of contracting with a look at third country nationals. The foreign subcontractors make up a huge portion of the contracting workforce. So on one level, the human trafficking initially is voluntary. A broker will come to you and say, listen, I have this great job. And so you go. But as you go, all of a sudden you realize that actually they're not taking you to Afghanistan legally and you don't have the correct paperwork. And now you're staying at a base that has a large amount of criminal activity and you've essentially been smuggled in. Don't forget to subscribe. And while you're there, leave us a review. You can also let us know your thoughts at podcast at stripes.com. Also, follow us on Twitter for updates at Stars and Stripes. Force for Hire's supervising editors are Bob Reed and Terry Leonard. Digital team lead and editor is Michael Darnell. Thanks for listening. This, this is, is Force, Force for, for Hire. hire.